Hi, nice to see you. You too, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, what has this got to do with renewable energy? I can hear you asking. We'll get to that. Uh, it was in 2003, some of you may remember, the smash hit, The Internet is for Porn, from the uh, musical Avenue Q. Um, of course, it was a joke. Uh, the internet was for illegal downloads on Napster. No, look, the point is that in the early days of the internet, and 19, uh, 2003 wasn't that early, but innovation flourished. People used the technology in all kinds of ways that had not been imagined, whether it be e-commerce giants like pets.com or the uh, incredible future of social networking with MySpace. Um, the point was that people were able to put stuff on the internet, see how it goes. The stuff that worked, grew, and the stuff that didn't, disappeared. But it changed the world we live in. Um, the internet, as we all know, kind of roughly started, the World Wide Web, roughly started with uh, Tim Berners-Lee. And um, obviously, speaking to a wired audience, I don't need to explain the full history. But broadly speaking, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was able to come up with a protocol for presenting material on the early internet called the World Wide Web. And he just kind of tried it and put it out there, and it changed the world. But what if Tim had had to wait seven years before he could do that? He might have carried on trying, and the internet's revolution might have started seven years later, but he'd probably have given up. He'd probably have given up and done something else with his life. Um, maybe he would have believed what Robert Medcalf said in 1995, which was, uh, the, uh, Robert Medcalf, I don't know him, he was the inventor of Ethernet. And he said the internet will spectacularly explode. Tim might have been put off by that, given up the idea of, of the World Wide Web, given up the idea of information interchange. Um, we certainly wouldn't have seen Google in 1998. Uh, we wouldn't have seen Facebook and, well, YouTube, Netflix, and even the porn sites that, you know, um, our friends at Avenue Q were so obsessed by. And yet, this is the world of renewable energy today. It takes less than a year to do the engineering to build a wind farm. But it takes seven years, on average, in the UK, to get a grid connection. And if you want to build stuff on the grid, you have to persuade the powers that be, the central authorities, the government department knows Bayes. Um, you have to persuade National Grid that someone will want this power. Um, you have to persuade them that they're going to be able to shift it to where they think people are going to use it. It's disastrous. So we're sitting here with a revolution that's probably more important for the, than the internet. I mean, literally the one that will save our planet. And yet, thanks to the fact we have enormous amounts of central planning, it's held back. And, and I guess you know, it's not just the UK. Try this, all right? In Germany, if you want to install a smart meter, it has to be shipped in basically a safe in the back of a van. And the safe has a one-time use key. So, uh, if you open the safe and you, and you can't install this one, that, you know, I'm afraid that's it. Um, that's because, as an intent, of course smart meters have to be secure. But so does my iPhone. And it arrives, well, from pretty much any e-commerce site, pretty much anyway, in a car box, and I just plug it in. in. In the excessively regulated world of renewables, we're held back everywhere by the fact that regulators don't understand the degree of change that's needed. They don't understand the technology we need to bring to bear. I don't blame the regulators. But you know, if we'd asked the newspaper industry to define the protocols for the internet, it would be very, very different. That's what we're doing in the green energy system. Um, I guess it's fair to say there's a lot more regulation stopping you putting green energy on the grid than there is stopping you putting porn on the internet. That's kind of bonkers. Um, so the key, I think, to unlocking the astonishing opportunities for businesses, for society, and for our planet 
is to start treating the energy system more like the internet to allow a flourishing of innovation. Innovation in how we generate electricity and how we use it. Um, today's grid, I would say, is broadly not fit for purpose. And I don't mean the company national grid. <laughs> I mean the physical infrastructure, but also the uh, governance by which it's built. Uh, the grid was designed in the UK and pretty much every advanced economy to ship electricity from the coal fields to the population centers. But today, we need an energy system which understands that instead of having 130 coal-fired power stations and half a dozen nuclear ones, what we've got is millions of individual generating points, whether it be the solar panels on people's roofs, the solar farms distributed through the country, the wind farms through the country, the wind farms offshore, and the connections to other countries. We need to move away from a centrally planned system, a world in which the national grid central command office looks like a minicab office. There are literally blokes with phones who dispatch power the way that people used to dispatch a cab. And we need to move to a world like Uber, where we take vast amounts of data in real time about the energy that's been generated, match supply and demand at a place and at a time. Just to give you an idea about how bad this is, by the way, um, in, in the first quarter of last year, the UK threw away 300 million pounds of green electrons. Carbon-free, beautiful green electrons, because we didn't have the system to carry them. Um, at other times this year, during the energy crisis, a period when we are desperate for energy, when it's windy in Scotland, we turn off the wind turbines and we pay the owners for the fact that they can't generate because we don't have the cables to transmit it, and we don't have the uh, systems that would allow Scottish people to enjoy that cheap power. For example, by electric vehicles that charge when it's windy. So when I say the system's not fit for purpose, I really do mean that um, here and everywhere. I guess it's a bit like a public transport system where you know, sometimes it's hugely overcrowded, sometimes it's empty. And what you need to do is move to a world in which people are encouraged to use the power when it's available, and encourage to use the infrastructure when it's empty. Uh, and I think this is really important because the, the move to renewable power is not a like-for-like -like replacement of the fossil fuel system. We've got to create an entirely new way of enjoying unbelievably cheap, hugely abundant, zero marginal cost, zero carbon, zero gilt energy, but it ain't the same as the way we use fossil fuels. For example, um, if you speak to the, the, the sort of dinosaur part of the energy industry, the first thing they'll talk about with renewables, they'll, they'll say, look, renewables are intermittent. You've got the problem about what, when it's not windy. But if we discovered renewables before we discovered fossil fuels, we'd have understood that the key is that when it is windy, we can tap into vast amounts of unbelievably cheap power. The great news is that we're getting renewable generation at the same time as we're changing how we consume electricity. So electric vehicles, the battery in a typical uh, electric car might do two or 300 miles. Um, the average commute in the UK is nine miles. You don't need a full battery all the time. If you leave your car plugged in, and we know that you know, it's windy today, but it's not going to be windy for a few days, we'll charge your car up and then let it run itself down. Machine learning understands your driving habits. I mean, they don't know where you're going. Obviously, it's not the internet. But um, they do understand kind of what your typical battery usage is. So you make sure that you never need to think about it. There's always enough in there. But we're grabbing it when it's windy and sunny. That's electric cars. Uh, you can do the same with electric heat pumps. Heat pumps are magic. You know, they understand the weather. They understand the thermal, thermal properties of your house. Um, Typically in the UK, it's very expensive to use electricity between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. So the heat pump can slightly overheat the home before 4 p.m. You won't notice half a degree. Let it drift down uh, by 7 p.m., barely using any electricity, helping solve this problem about how do we make the most of the infrastructure we've got. This tech is all out there. It's all out there, right? But, you know, I guess, unlike the internet, where people were able to just put stuff on the system, today we have to try and persuade Bureaucrats, and forgive me, there's nothing wrong. Civil servants are incredible people who work hard because they believe in what they do. But we have to persuade people who don't understand this new world of it rather than just building it. 
Um, I think it's really important to talk about this fact that tech is there today. Because too often, I think we're asked to believe in hit and hope solutions. Don't worry about this, we've got nuclear fusion around the corner. My goodness, I really hope we get nuclear fusion, it'll be amazing. But we can't wait for it. Carbon sequestration, don't worry, we can keep burning gas and we'll just bury the carbon. It's never worked at scale. And by the way, the reason we burn gas is it's cheap and convenient. As soon as you try to bury the carbon, it's no longer cheap and convenient. You're better off just taking the stuff that really is now very cheap and very convenient. Octopus has got form here. Our company created uh, what we call the Agile Tariff. It was the world's first truly consumerized real-time tariff. The price changes every half hour. You can check the app on your phone. You'll always know what the price is if you care. But you just learn the general pattern. It's like travel. I don't need to check the timetables to know that trains are expensive at rush hour in the morning. They may be expensive at rush hour in the evening, and everything else is pretty cheap, and overnight might be very cheap. It's just the same. But through using APIs, it can connect to equipment. It connects to electric vehicles, to the chargers, to home batteries, to solar panels. The whole system then self-optimizes. It optimizes the, the level that matters most in the home and then scales out from there. Uh, again, uh, another octopus innovation. Well, I'm not here to flog octopus, but it's just because we've done some of this stuff and we've spent hundreds of millions on it, so I might as well say how well it works. Um, that wind turbine uh, generates uh, electricity, in, and that one's in Yorkshire, and people who live nearby get half-priced electricity when it's windy. Thus, they shift their demand to the points, for example, you know, run your dishwasher when it's windy and you know it's going to be cheap. You don't need to check an app. If it's windy, it's going to be cheap, right? Very, very straightforward. And, and by the way, these are the kind of behaviors we have in other markets. We're all used to going into a supermarket and seeing stuff with a yellow label. Some people will buy it. Some people will go in for whatever they bought, uh, went in for anyway. But it balances the system, makes it less wasteful, and drives costs down for everybody. Um, I guess the challenge here, whenever you read about the kind of green transition, you'll be reading people saying, how will we solve this problem? How will we deal with intermittency? Or how will we deal with non-windy uh, non days, things like that? But no one asked when the iPhone was invented, you know, how will we make it accessible for Greg's gran? But my gran's 98. And when the pandemic happened, she got through it using a 60 pound or 80 pound Android tablet that would never have existed without the iPhone. The point being, what we need to do is open up the system. The more of this stuff we pile onto it, the more we'll find ways to use it. And I said it's not a like flight transition. The way in which uh, smartphones have changed the world, green energy is going to do it as well. The first industrial revolution came about when we discovered cheap energy by burning hundreds of millions of years worth of fossils. The next industrial revolution is going to come back because of this stuff. For example, um, we've got a bunch of customers on our books who are vertical farms. These are incredible. I, I genuinely didn't realize the power until we went to visit one. And um, it's a large warehouse building right next to the town or city or uh, population center where people are eating the food that's grown inside. 99% of the water that goes into the building leaves in the fruit and veg. It's a sealed environment. There's no pesticides. This is unbelievably healthy stuff. Of course, the big problem is the crops need light and heat. But in a renewable world, what we've found is that you can actually light and heat the crops when it's windy and sunny, when renewable energy is abundant, when it's cheap. So it ends up being great for carbon, and it's eliminating food miles. Instead of flying fresh fruit and veg around the world, you're growing it where it's consumed. And it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And more of this we build, the cheaper it gets. Um, this not like for like transition is really, really important to get your head around, right? I, I guess for me, uh, I look at the possibilities that were opened up. On the way here, I walked from our office. The number of times electric cars just silently glided by. You know, it's not just about uh, the critically important climate change. It's actually making a better world. In the UK alone, 30,000 people die every year because of uh, local air pollution. Most of it comes from burning stuff. It comes from gas boilers and car engines. Um, moving to a clean world tackles that. By the way, the global figure is about 10 million deaths a year. And solving this here doesn't just um, improve the UK. Just like with smartphones, where uh, the technology enabled developing countries to leapfrog landlines and get access to the power of modern communications, 
So it is with green energy. The more we build this decentralized, super cheap, clean system that makes the most of electrons when they're abundant, that technology is going to bring reliable, cheap power to the 800 million people in the world that today have no access to energy and to the 2 billion people that only have it intermittently. So, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this. When Apple launched the iPhone, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, literally laughed and he said there will be no chance it's going to get any market share. The iPhone changed the world because it had access to the market. We now need to give access to the market to all the technologies that are going to transform energy. Thank you, everyone.